Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to hear about the aristocrat and the able seaman. Everybody knows that on her maiden voyage, Titanic hit an iceberg and sank. But as the years go by, although everybody knows that, the individual stories tend to get forgotten. I discovered about the aristocrat and the able seaman when I was researching for my novel. The aristocrat is my great-grandmother, and the able seaman and she had only one thing in common when they boarded Titanic, and that was their age. She was 32 and he was 33. So this talk is for them and to remember them. It wasn't until the night of the 14th of April that Titanic hit the iceberg and for four days nothing much happened. It wasn't even very cold but they ate well and they walked on the boat deck, the first class passengers, other passengers had other decks to walk on. The reason I'm showing you the boat deck is that nowadays, and sometimes then, there was very little room to walk on a boat deck. But Bruce Ismay, who was the chairman of the White Star Line, turned down a design for the deck that would have accommodated many, many more lifeboats. He said, he didn't think his first-class passengers would pay to travel on a ship whose decks were cluttered with lifeboats. But actually, Titanic wasn't breaking any law by not having enough lifeboats for the number of people on board. In those days, the law was made by the Board of Trade, and the Board of Trade said that lifeboats on a passenger liner had to match the ship's tonnage. It had nothing to do with the numbers of people. But there was a good reason for this, and the reason was that the North Atlantic was full of liners. And so the idea was that if your ship should get into trouble, first of all, it would sink slowly. Secondly, the captain and crew would put the passengers into the lifeboats. They would row to the next boat, which would be obvious, they'd be able to see its lights because there were so many sailing in those days, and come back and take the next lot and take them to the, exactly. However, for various reasons, this didn't happen. But there was another boat very close by. It was called the Californian. And I'll tell you about that in a second. Titanic hit the iceberg at 11.40 on the 14th of April. There was very little sound. The, she hit it side on, so the iceberg ripped into her watertight compartments on the starboard side, far underwater. And the only people who would have heard anything were the third-class men whose cabins were forward and low down. And, and the sound that's been described is like tearing silk. People in second class and first class probably didn't hear anything. My great-grandmother, who knew a bit about boats, because she and her husband had a yacht, went up onto the boat deck just to see what an iceberg was like. Nobody thought there was anything wrong, any problem, anything to be worried about. Titanic didn't have a PA system or a tannoy or anything, so they couldn't tell people, but they also didn't want to tell people to panic them until Captain Smith and Thomas Andrews had been down to investigate what had happened. And when Thomas Andrews saw that six of the watertight compartments had been holed, he said to Captain Smith, she hasn't the remotest chance of staying afloat. And this is partly to do with the design of the watertight compartments, which if you want to know more about, I can tell you about later. But it wasn't until two hours after she hit the iceberg 
that they actually started loading the lifeboats. The stewards had to go from cabin to cabin to cabin. So by then, you know, quite a few people would have been asleep. And get them up and tell them to put on their life belts and get them to start going up to the boat deck and getting into the lifeboats. My great grandmother wrote a long letter to her parents from the rescue ship. And this is what she said about striking the iceberg. We struck the iceberg at quarter to 12 on Sunday night. At first, and until nearly one o'clock, no one realized any danger or really knew what had happened. Then the order came to be dressed and have life belts on in 10 minutes. And we were then put into the lifeboats at quarter to two. Lifeboat number eight was my great grandmother's lifeboat and able seaman Thomas Jones's. And it left Titanic with 35 people in it, which is only half full. But again, the reason for this was that there was another boat quite close by and they wanted to get the boats off, take them to the next, uh, to the ship that was quite close by and come back to board more, more people. Most of the passengers didn't know that there weren't enough lifeboats. My great grandmother also wrote this. She said, I just had time to pour out some brandy, give my Oni, who was her lady's maid, some, and Gladys and myself and hurriedly dress. Then no one seemed to know where the lifeboats were kept. And a strange man found ours for us and we then tied on his for him. And we all shook hands and told each other that it would not be long before we met again, as we all thought there were plenty of boats, little knowing that there were only 16. But as I said, it wasn't illegal. It wasn't, they weren't breaking any law and the shipping lanes were full. The ship that was nearby was called the Californian. But on this night, on the 14th and 15th of April, it was flat calm, which is partly why they didn't see the iceberg, because an iceberg acts like a piece of land. And if there are waves, you can see it. If the sea is flat calm, you can't see it quite often until you're very close. Secondly, it was a very, very starry night. And when Captain Stanley Lord of the Californian was asked why he didn't steam towards Titanic, he said this to the US inquiry. I pointed out to the officer, one of his officers obviously, that I thought I saw a light coming along and it was a most peculiar light. And we had been making mistakes all along with the stars thinking they were signals. We could not distinguish where the sky ended and where the water commenced. You understand it was a flat calm sea. The officer also said, he thought it was a star, and I didn't say anything more. So when Titanic's lights gradually disappeared as she sank, Captain Lord thought she was steaming southwards. If he thought anything at all, he might have just thought they were stars. Abel Seaman Thomas Jones was ordered to man lifeboat number eight. There were no other sailors on board. There were two other men. There was a first class steward and a cook, but neither of them knew anything about boats. As I said, there were 35 people, which is about the number of us, I think, tonight. The boats were quite big, but one sailor to, you, you, you they, they, they were big enough that you couldn't man a pair of oars, so only one person could do one oar and then another one on the other side. Sorry, as you can tell, I'm not very booty. I'm doing my best. Um, but he watched my great-grandmother. He saw that she was comforting people. There were some very, very hysterical women who'd had to leave their husbands, their fathers, their brothers, their uncles behind. And she was calming them down, but he also heard her talking about boats. And so he asked her what she knew, and she said 
she knew how to row. She said, I know how to take a tiller. And so he put her at the tiller. He actually said in an interview when they got to New York, there was a woman on my boat as was a woman. I was in command, but I had to row and I wanted somebody at the tiller. When I saw the way she was carrying herself and heard the quiet, determined way she spoke to the others, this bit I love, I knew she was more of a man than any we had on board, and I put her at the tiller. <laughs>